This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good evening, everyone. We'll call to meeting to order this uh, joint uh, land use meeting of the Stratford Housing Partnership, Planning Commission, Zoning Commission, Board of Zoning Appeals, and Architectural Review Board. Hope I got everybody. Um, we'll call and it to order council. at uh, Town Council. Excuse me, don't want to forget the Town Council <laughs> at uh, 5.30 p.m. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Silhavy. For those of you that few of you might not know me, um, I wear a couple of hats um, as the chairman of the Zoning Commission, also as chairman of the Stratford Housing Partnership. Um, and what we're going to do right now, just to get a feel for who's here, is I'm going to ask our secretary, Aileen Marsh, to call the roll and just let me know who's here and who isn't. So, Eileen, take it. Eileen, uh, roll call. Can you hear me? You might be frozen. Okay. Either that or she's holding a very strong stare. Eileen, <laughs> can you hear us? Um, I can... If you have it handy. I'm sorry, yes, I can. Okay. okay. <clears throat> do you want me to do the roll call? Yeah, please do. Um, and says, Mina, you might want to stand by, I think. Okay. So, when I call your name, if you could please identify yourself as here. We'll start with the strap Toda. Yes. yes. This is Mita. Christopher Blake. Absent. I think she's frozen. So if yeah, you would I like think Eileen's having some difficulty. Can you yeah. take it, Sabrina? Sure. So I'm going to announce your names and please let me know if you're in the meeting or not. If you're not, obviously you're not there. Um, members of the Stra Stratford Housing Partnership first. It's myself, Beth Smith, Ponte. Uh, Christopher Blake, uh, Beth DePonte, Mayor Laura Hoydick. Here, but Aileen so Smith is calling the roll too. Yeah, you're you're having some technical difficulties on your side, Aileen. You keep coming in and out. I need your iPad. Desmond. Pull this up. Jennifer Sheldon. I'm here. This might take some time. <laughs> okay. We may be getting her Can on you hear delay. Me now? You might be able to mute. Yeah. You might be able to yeah. mute her. Can Let's you hear me? Send her a message. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Do you want me to start the roll call with the town council? Um, uh, Aileen, it, we didn't hear any names before that um, for the partnership. Okay. I, okay. Um, let's, we'll start again. I, I don't know. I must have trouble with the other iPad. Um, so we have Susmitha, Christopher Blake, Beth DePonte, Mayor Laura Hoydick. I'm here. And did you Desmond, hear that Beth's here too? Aileen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Desmond? Jennifer Sheldon? Here. Christopher, Christopher Sohavy? Here. Elizabeth Watson? Uh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth Sulik? Here. Harold Watson? Here. And Glenn Chalder? Okay, from the town council, Christopher Pia. Present. Caitlin Shake. Here. Paul Tavares. 
Here. <clears throat> Dave Hoffman. <clears throat> Greg Kahn. Here. Ken Poisson. <laughs> Bill Perillo. Here. Jim Connor. He's there. Bill O'Brien. Here. Laura Dancho. Here. And Margo Pick. Council Clerk. I'm here. And William Boyd. Here. Okay, Planning Commission, William Boyd. Here. Christina, Susanna. Here. Here. Bill Semt. John Staley could not make it. Harold, Deborah Lamberti. She's here. From the Zoning Commission, Dion. Oh, okay. Uh, from the here. Zoning Commission, Dion Francis. Michael Henrik, Jim Bliotti, Albacola, Rich Fredette, here, Linda Manos, here, Bon. From Zoning Board of Appeal, Lorenzo Elder, Gavin Forrester, Glenn Petroselli, Annette Street, Judy Cleary. Here. Ron Tickey. And then from the Architectural Review Board, Shannon Hovan. Steve Law. Amy Millward. Here. Tom Zarkowitz. John Zabel. And town representatives, Mary Dean, Jay Hibansky. Here. And that concludes my roll call. Thanks for your patience while the other iPad froze. Sorry. Aileen, uh, Aileen, do you want the callers to identify themselves for the record? There are two callers that I don't have their names here. Oh, absolutely. Okay. If someone called in whose name I did not call, if you could please identify yourself and let us know if you're a member of the public or if you're with a town board or commission. Uh, this is Desmond Z. I'm with the Stratford Housing Partnership. And this is a uh, shot. This is uh, Sean Kennedy, a member of the public. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sean, what's your last name? Uh, Kennedy. There is one unidentified caller, Aileen, caller number four. Okay, I didn't get that. Wasn't Desmond? Did someone call in on their phone? I did not call. If you could just say your name. Uh, Greg Cans also dialed in on his phone. Okay, Greg, you're also caller four. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Eileen, and thank you, everybody. I know we're 
I'm doing this meeting sort of in the, you know, at an unusual time, a little bit earlier probably than most of your meetings are used to, but I appreciate everybody making the time to come to us. Um, the This item on the agenda is just the overview of the goals of the meeting, and I wanted to take a, a couple minutes just to uh, give you a little bit of a, a higher level view of what we've been doing. Uh, some of you folks have been with us before when we've had these joint meetings, especially from the Land Use Board, um, and uh, you've had the uh, probably been aware that we have over the last almost eight or nine months been working on um, what's called the housing plan, and it is something that we are statutorily required to do by the state of Connecticut, um, and it is one of a number of plans that are required from time to time, uh, like for example the plan of conservation and development. Um, I see former Chairman Isabel here. He and I worked on that uh, some years ago. So we compiled these plans and it is setting out a blueprint of what our strategies can be to move forward in a certain public policy area. Um, obviously zoning and housing is becoming a very big issue, uh, especially up in Hartford this session. So we want to make sure that we are being proactive as a commission, as a town, and not so much reactive. So this uh, document that we're going to go over today is something that will be coming before the various boards, including the council, uh, for your review and uh, most likely adoption. We're just working on some of the details of how exactly that works, and uh, that will be coming within the next few months. So figure B, uh, probably uh, by the summertime, you will actually begin to see this. So we want to make sure that we have your input. Um, over the period of the last few months, the partnership um, and uh, has been involved in a number of activities, including our in reviewing our current strategies as laid out in the two previous um, POCDs, uh, reviewing census data, and evaluating uh, future strategies for housing within the town. We've sought feedback through joint meetings in November, and then there has been a public consultation period um, through a, a vehicle of a survey. Uh, obviously, it'd be much easier to be doing this in pre-COVID days where we would probably have something of a public hearing or a, um, uh, a forum down at the uh, Baldwin Center like we've had uh, during we did the uh, Complete Streets project. Um, so, But we've had to make do with electronic means very much the way all of us are doing it right now. So uh, working with our consultant, uh, who is Glenn Childer, you're going to hear from him in a few minutes. Uh, we've come up with a, a couple documents. Uh, one, I believe they should have been provided to you. One is an executive summary, which is uh, somewhat high level and hits a lot of the high notes of what we've accomplished and what we're proposing. And uh, second of all, a more detailed 24-page document, uh, which is the actual plan. So before we get into the details of that, um, I just want to uh, thank publicly, uh, first of all, Mayor Hoydick for your leadership in recalling uh, this um, this body, which had been uh, dormant for a number of years, recalling it into session and uh, forming it. And I also want to thank my uh, fellow uh, partnership members. It is a very diverse group with different backgrounds um, and experiences within the town. Um, it is bipartisan or nonpartisan, whichever way you want to call that. Um, and it seeks to make sure that we present a document that we can uh, use as our strategies going forward. And one cautionary tale to everyone, this is a plan. Plans do change over time. These are not specific legislative proposals that we are gonna be putting that are necessarily set in stone. We certainly wanna have as much input as possible from people that know the town the best, especially our elected leaders. And uh, we can be going through some, make some additional refinements if they're necessary. Your suggestions are certainly welcome. Um, and then once it is adopted, uh, then the uh, work can really commence, which would be to actually start um, implementing some of these ideas um, to get us to a better place. So I think I've talked enough a lot. Uh, um, Glenn, would you like to uh, walk the uh, our officials through? I, I, I would enjoy that very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, members of the Housing Partnership, and welcome um, to my first meeting with many of you on the town council and other boards and commissions. Um, I've put together a PowerPoint to provide an overview of the plan. So I'm going to share a screen here in a moment uh, that may take up your screen, and then we'll we'll open it up for questions and comments uh, later as we go. Uh, as Chris mentioned, we're creating a document which is called Housing Strategies for Stratford. 
Um, and tonight we're hoping to get your thoughts, ideas, and feedback on this document um, so we can refine it moving forward. Uh, the program basically is to give you an overview of the draft report, uh, hopefully get comments and feedback on how to improve this document and make it a better plan. And as, as Chris pointed out, to tune this to the Stratford, and then we can talk a little bit about next steps in the process. Um, in terms of the draft report, as Chris indicated, the housing partnership has been working on this for some time, um, discussing different thoughts and ideas. We had a joint meeting with the uh, land use boards in the fall to get their thoughts and feedback in terms of issues and concerns to them. Um, and we uh, did uh, surveys, online surveys of the community and have incorporated that information into this plan as well. The plan document starts off with an overview of the housing partnership. as uh, Chris indicated uh, the mayor uh, reconstituted, reestablished the uh, housing partnership to move us uh, into addressing these sorts of issues. Um, and this is the charge here of the housing partnership in terms of examining and identifying housing needs and opportunities and developing a long range uh, plan to satisfy housing needs in the community. So that was the charge given to the group through our discussions. We've talked through different ideas and um, we have organized our work around a general goal, uh, which is seek to provide for a variety of housing choices in Stratford for people and households of all ages and characteristics. Um, and that is where our efforts in this plan have been directed. There's an introductory sec section, which provides an overview about addressing housing needs. The partnership recognized that, that people need housing and people need housing that meets their circumstances and needs. Um, and people's needs are diverse and changing. Um, the age composition of the community is changing. People seek different types of housing at different points in their lives. One of the things that we discovered as part of the survey information, we asked people where they had lived in the past, what types of housing units, where they live today, what type of housing unit, and where they thought they might live in the future. And people's pasts and futures were quite diverse compared to where people live today. And these housing needs have been recognized for some time in Stratford in terms of the prior plans of conservation and development. Um, but the challenge we sometimes have with housing is that housing actually takes quite a while to produce a housing unit. So planning means that we're gonna start looking today what some of these housing needs are and can be in the community in the future, and then start to lay the groundwork uh, to address these types of housing needs in the future. So that's why we're planning and that's why we're thinking ahead as well. As was indicated, the Planning Commission has the statutory responsibility to prepare a plan of conservation and development. The 2014 plan identified goals, objectives, policies, and action steps related to housing. Um, and some of those uh, carried from the 2003 plan of conservation and development. For almost 20 years now, Stratford has recognized some of these housing issues in the community. The needs and circumstances of, of the community have changed during that time period. Um, and so we are building on this effort um, in trying to move these uh, strategies, policies, and recommendations uh, into the future. The Housing Partnership undertook uh, five different surveys. Um, the survey questions were all very similar, but they were targeted a little bit to each audience that we were seeking input from. So one survey was directed towards Stratford residents. We had over a thousand participants, uh, people who logged on and clicked and started that survey. Um, we asked members of local boards and commissions, and you may have recalled seeing this uh, email or several emails, if you will, encouraging and asking for your participation. We had 73 participants of uh, local boards and commissions. Um, that we surveyed the members of the Stratford Housing Partnership so that they could let their hair down and, and, and react to the policies and strategies that we were discussing. We reached out to local nonprofit organizations. We had 10 participants there. Um, and they, through those nonprofit organizations, they were supposed to allow people or individuals that, that uh, they work with or serve um, so that they could participate in their survey. Uh, but based on the nature of those responses um, and the organizations that participated, we weren't sure that that survey of nonprofit uh, organizations and the people that they identified 
were the most representative of the community overall. So those reports are available uh, at town hall, but we haven't highlighted those in this report. This is the chart I was talking about here on page eight. Uh, it identifies uh, where people lived before. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of diversity uh, in terms of the housing units that people lived in before. But when we ask people what they lived in today, most, most people lived in a single family house. Um, yet, when we ask people where they thought they might want to live in the future, again, it starts to get more diverse. So this is influential in our thinking that, that perhaps some housing choices and diversity in Stratford could be beneficial and useful so that people who have lived there so far in their life could continue to live here in the future as well. We also asked people what they thought about the mix of housing, whether they thought there was too little, too much, or just about right in different types of housing units. And some people thought that there might be areas where we had too much housing uh, and other areas where perhaps we didn't have quite enough. Uh, eventually in the report, these boxes will be filled with pictures of the different types of housing styles so that people can understand what it is that we're talking about. Um, and we do have a collection of pictures of different developments in Stratford overall. We asked people what factors were important to them in housing. If they were going to be looking for housing today, what was important to them? And as you can see on this list, item number four was price and affordability as being a significant consideration and very important for people. Um, and that carried through across all of the surveys um, that we conducted. We discovered as part of our work, we asked people whether or not they were spending more than 30% of their income on housing today. And that is a generally recognized federal standard for what's called housing cost burden. Um, and for people who make more than the median income, spending more than 30% of their income on housing is a choice, which doesn't necessarily affect other parts of their lives. But for people who earn less than the median income, spending more than 30% of that income on housing actually can challenge their ability to have transportation, to um, get adequate food, uh, participate in activities, uh, travel to work, and other things. So this is an issue and I think an indication of the fact that there are housing needs uh, in Stratford overall. And if it's the two thirds of the survey participants and if that's representative of the community, that could be the neighbor on each side of you. And I think it's important to remember. In terms of the strategies, um, we identified what those strategies uh, might be. Um, the sidebar notes here indicate the survey results they're always organized that the resident response is on the left, the members of the partnership in the middle, and then board and commissioners members on the right hand side. So the first strategy was supporting the housing authority, and this was increasing the number of elderly and disabled units and increasing the number of family units. There was more support for elderly units than there was for housing units for low income family. Uh, but generally speaking, there was uh, at least 50% support for these initiatives. And these are people who can be at the lowest income levels and have the greatest housing needs. Um, and so that's why this ended up being strategy number one, that we can work and continue to work with the housing authority to address those uh, situations. Strategy number two was the concept of implementing what's called inclusionary zoning. Inclusionary zoning can be a situation where as development occurs, we include affordable housing units as part of that development, either through the construction of new units as part of a new development um, or some other options, which could be payment of a fee in lieu of affordable housing units or a zoning permit fee, which can accumulate funds for us to be able to assist people in situations with housing needs in the community. You may have heard over the years of what's called uh, the Affordable Housing Appeals Procedure in the state. That's Connecticut General Statute 8-30G. They have a goal or a threshold of 10% of the housing stock um, that if a community doesn't have 10% of the housing stock categorized as affordable, that a community can be subject to the Affordable Housing Appeals Procedure. If Stratford if housing gets built in Stratford without any new affordable units, we're actually falling further and further behind on attaining that threshold. So if we can consider ways to incorporate inclusionary housing as part of our future efforts, we can eat, hold pace or catch up uh, to that threshold overall. Strategy number three is looking at ways to enable more housing options in the community. 
Stratford today has a number of two family dwelling units in the community, but in certain zoning districts, those two family dwellings are not actually permitted uses. They become non-conforming and that creates challenges for people who actually live there. So one of the thoughts was to legitimize those housing units um, so that they can be fixed up over time um, and improved and help address the housing needs in the community. Um, so that was one of these strategies. And then another one was the possibility of a, a revisiting the accessory apartment regulations. These are situations where, where people can have uh, an apartment in their home for uh, themselves. They can live there and rent out uh, another part of the dwelling, um, provide for a caregiver or a caretaker, um, and providing some flexibility in this regulation might address some of the housing needs and situations in the community as well. Stratford does have uh, uh, strategy 3.3. Stratford, Stratford does have uh, some provisions in its zoning regulations for multifamily development. Um, some of the provisions are inconsistent. Some of them relate to uh, situations which existed probably two or three decades ago uh, in terms of limitations related to the number of units that could be built, et cetera. So one of the recommendations here is the town to undertake a review of those regulations and see if they could be improved, streamlined, uh, modified in ways that are appropriate for Stratford overall um, to uh, look at the provision of affordable housing. Um, and also to guide multifamily locations. One of the questions we asked uh, residents and others as part of the survey was whether or not they felt that Stratford should enable multifamily housing townwide. And the general sense was people were not enamored with that concept. They didn't think that multifamily should be permitted in all areas of Stratford. Um, later on, uh, we asked the same question, whether or not they thought that the town center area, areas along Route 1 might be appropriate for multifamily housing and the level of support increased. Um, so I think uh, people have some concerns about multifamily housing, um, but they think that it might fit in some locations better than others. And that's one of the things that this strategy could look at. Strategy number four is about revisiting design guidelines. One of the things that the survey responses clearly pointed out, you can see on the sidebar here on page 16, the amount of green and some of these survey responses. And people felt strongly that there were different types of housing that could fit into the character of Stratford better than others. And so they wa wanted to encourage the town to revisit the design guidelines, um, so that we increase and improve our chances about getting better design and better development um, is because people felt, again, that the design of new housing uh, was important to them in the community overall. Strategy number five is about supporting and facilitating aging in place. Um, there's indication all over the country that the that the percentage of the population in the older age groups is growing. And so this strategy here is to encourage people and support people who choose to age in place in their home, um, uh, take advantage of municipal services, the senior center, social services, um, dial a ride, all sorts of things that uh, can help people uh, continue to live in Stratford, in their housing, um, and continue to be part of the community. Strategy number six was talking about exploring some funding opportunities. Um, some communities have established a housing trust fund, which is where uh, funds can go um, through housing efforts. It can be a place where grants and uh, other uh, funding um, finds a home uh, that can be used to support housing in the community. And also to look at the possibility of revisiting the CDBG funding priorities. The town gets about $500,000 a year or more um, to fund activities uh, to benefit low and moderate income residents. Um, and how these funds are allocated um, could be adjusted uh, if it was felt to be appropriate um, to focus on uh, addressing some of the housing needs and situations in the community. Strategy number seven is about enhancing the housing toolbox. Um, this can be situations in the future where affordable housing units can have deed restrictions that limit their sale price. Um, and these can get quite complicated. And so some communities have established a standard affordable housing plan 
um, identified a third party administrator to help manage those plans. Um, and I think um, another thing that communities have done, which is strategy 7.1 here, is uh, looking at ways to extend the affordability period for deed restricted units. <clears throat> Connecticut General Statute 8-30D, which as I mentioned before, the Affordable Housing Appeals Procedure was adopted around 1989. And the initial term of deed restrictions was 20 years and it went to 30 years and now it's up to 40 years. But units that have been built have come off the list. And it would seem to me it might be in Stratford's interest to consider ways to preserve affordable housing units for longer periods of time. And other towns are considering this strategy as well. Strategy number eight is to look at ways to obtain an exemption or a moratoria. Um, for us to become exempt from the affordable housing appeals procedure, we'd have to create several hundred units of housing and we're not gonna get there quickly. Um, but I think with uh, an effort over time, um, we could move in that direction. Strategy number nine is continuing to collaborate and educate with other entities and agencies at the regional level, local level, state level, that all are looking to address housing issues. Um, and I think there are ways that we can work effectively together with them. Lastly, there's consider other strategies. Um, Stratford has existing units which are uh, naturally affordable today. And if we can find ways to convert those to affordable units to have them counted, that would serve as well. Um, there might be the possibility of some additional zoning changes to support housing choices or uh, address housing needs. Um, look at regulations to encourage or enable adaptive reuse of existing buildings to convert existing buildings from one use to perhaps another use. Um, and also consider smaller scale multifamily housing opportunities. On the bottom of page 23 is this graphic for what's called the missing middle housing. And what this refers to is that oftentimes housing development today tends to be single family subdivisions or large multifamily projects but all of the housing in the middle, duplexes, triplexes, courtyard buildings, court, uh, bungalow courts, townhouses, are development patterns that existed in the past but really don't today. Um, and there may be ways for us to investigate ways to bring this into our community to provide uh, housing opportunities, address housing needs, um, and include affordable housing as part of that. So that's an overview of the housing strategies report. Um, and I look forward to your thoughts or feedback. Got to figure out how to. There we go. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Um, thank you, so that covers a lot of the strategies that we have been exploring. Hopefully, it didn't. It wasn't uh, too overwhelming, too scary, but hopefully, it. Um, provoked your thoughts, and um, we're certainly looking forward to hearing any um, any comments or questions um, that you might have. So, uh, what I think we'll do is we'll we'll open the floor, and I think um, you know I'm happy to hear what anyone has to say and uh, take it down. And then, if uh, either Glenn or if any members of the partnership um, can chime in with the answers, um, you know we're happy to have that discussion. How do we raise our hand? That's a great question. I think there, you know, I go back and forth between Zoom and GoToMeeting, and I can never remember if there is a feature on here. <laughs> no, not on GoToMeeting, unfortunately. Not you have to do it the old-fashioned. You have to do it the okay. old-fashioned way. Oh, you just I'll have raise to my wave hand. frantically. Is that That's, it? Like, <laughs> yeah, wave it. <laughs> and I can only see six of you, so that's going to make it even harder. So. Ah, great. Or whoever's oh, got the jackhammer can speak it. first. Yeah. Some motorcycles. What was that? <laughs> what are you doing? Saying that it's me, but I'm muted everywhere. Uh, well. Uh -oh. uh, is okay. that for, uh, I think it's your phone. Yeah, I think it's your phone. Okay. There you go. Okay, this Maybe is we'll William start. Boyd. Which, can Boyd, I ask for? Yeah. You, okay. Uh, hi. Let's start by let's start with the planning commission, Mr. Boyd. How, Commissioner. Boyd, okay. Certainly. I, I had two questions, and and number one, can we get a copy of the uh, aggregate, all the the uh, data that um, uh, the gentleman uh, showed us this evening? My first question is part of that survey. The south end here, 
where we live in, Paul um, uh, Paul represents, it's a little, lot more transient. So I don't know if that report was really representative of the area because a lot of people are not really connected to Chicago, although they live here. It's a pretty transient area in and out. And then my mm -hmm. second question is, uh, and this will be more for zoning, a lot of the zoning in Stratford is very restrictive in terms of frontal property, the width, so you can't subdivide. So a lot of that can be really handled if this just basic zoning changes were to happen. You could build on a lot of these projects you were talking about. So I'll listen for the answer. Okay, thank you, sir. Glenn, you wanna take that? Yep, thank you. Um, all of the information that the housing partnership uh, had prepared for them, including statistical analysis, is all reported uh, on the uh, housing partnership webpage. And so I think what you're looking for is what's known as booklet number two, which was an overview of the statistical information that we had at our disposal. We find ourselves at kind of a funny point because we discussed the fact that the census data that's available is 10 years old, 2010. The 2020 census is probably not going to be released. They're actually delayed from what is the normal release date. Um, so that could actually be a year or more before we get the data. And then the only other thing that's available is what's called the American Community Survey, which is based on a very small sample um, mm -hmm. and they estimate for the population based on prior relationships. So we're kind of feeling our way in a foggy room right now because the data is not as pre precise as we would like. But I think the patterns and the patterns over time are consistent. And I think that's what we based our recommendations on. The second thing I wanted to point out is that on the survey results, we recognize that there might be all sorts of ways that people might want to parse the data to understand differences between gender, difference between neighborhood, difference between uh, length of residency. So all of this, the data that we collected was put into Excel tables, and so Smith has those. So anybody who's interested can parse that data any way that they would like. Um, we did ask uh, what neighborhoods people lived in. We broke it down into sort of uh, north of the Merritt, between the Merritt and 95 and south of 95. So it doesn't have the degree of resolution that we might like to have, for example, council districts and other things like that. Um, but you can look at the data from those different perspectives and really drill down quite deeply. So um, the information is available and I encourage you all to, uh, who are so inclined to, to go dig into it and see what you can find. Did I, did I get all your questions, Mr. Boyd? Uh, you did, but uh, I guess the other question for, well, I did hear that, but so if we're working, you know, kind of in a fog, if it's 10 years lagging, the amount of people that have moved into Stratford has been, uh, uh, has been incredible in that last 10 years. Uh, you could see that just in the school system, the amount of children. So if we're planning on something for 2010, we're in 20, we're going to be off in, in what it is we're trying to plan. I think we're not planning for a specific outcome, for example, or number of units. I think what we're looking for is a, is a direction in terms of looking at housing choices and opportunities. So I think as Chris had indicated earlier, this plan, the state is requiring that this plan be done, that it be done by 2022. Um, and that yeah. uh, we start to move in this direction. Um, it's got to be updated every five years. So as the new census data comes out, if there are new patterns or information that becomes available, we can pick that up and roll with it, but we can't wait for it. Since the census got delayed you. right now, it, it could be longer. Got you, thank you. And I do see uh, one other comment that before I address that, um, it's also worth knowing that, you know, Stratford's population has hovered around 50,000 for a, at least 20 years. Um, yeah. I remember actually um, a million years ago when I was on the council, there were some grants that were available to municipalities that were over 50,000 and we were at 49,999 or something like that. And, and it became a, an issue there. So we have, while there's been lots of changes and there's been lots of growth, people move in, people move out, we've actually stayed relatively consistent and um and we've seen that in a, in, a, in a few different areas so we while we await the um the new census numbers i don't know that we're necessarily that that far off from even from where we were so i'd have to see exactly what the net is but i don't think it's uh, a statistically huge number um beth you had a comment on here i'll give the floor to you 
if I understand the question right, uh, the question has to do with possible bias in the survey population. And uh, the survey was part one aspect of the survey was definitely a convenient sample. That was the aspect of the survey that was uh, done through Facebook. But there's another survey that was done, and that was a survey of elected officials. Uh, that was more representative of the town. So if you want to, and, and this, you know, the information about the census data, yes, that really is the population that was surveyed. So one was a convenient sample, and the other one was a perfect example of, of, of people who serve up all the positions in our lives. So I would encourage you to look at that because that was should have um, people from all over the town who are involved and, and it doesn't have these issues about it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, let's stay with the Planning Commission. So, um, any questions or comments from other Planning Commissioners? Yes. Christina. Yeah. Christina, uh, Commissioner Kazanis, yes. good evening. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Um, I had a quick question, uh, two quick questions. One was, in the set, in the strategy around inclusionary zoning, you mentioned um, in lieu of fees, um, do you know of other communities that are using this? How are they using those fees? And what kind of transparency do they provide to the public about the use of funds? Like, what are those mechanisms? Yep, I think, thank, that's a great question. I think there are communities around the state that are doing this. I think people are trying to find their way as to how to make the most effective use of this. Um, the two communities that I'm most familiar with that are doing this, one is New Canaan and one is Fairfield. Um, mm -hmm. New Canaan is, had this fee for probably 10 or 12 years at this point in time. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, basically, they received fees as a result of zoning permits, so that you would get a zoning permit for adding a deck, and there was a small uh, fee addition on top of that. And just over time, it accumulated uh, quite a bit of money. They were looking to expand and modify and renovate their housing authority projects. Getting mm -hmm. the funding to actually do the design work and everything else can be a challenge and you have to wait for it. What they mm -hmm. decided to do is they use these funds to kickstart those projects. And as a result, they were, uh, what's the word, shovel ready uh, when the time came. And as a result, they've been able to undertake some significant projects, triple the number of housing authority units on the site that they had. And some of those projects were built in the 50s and 60s and 70s and were very sort of outdated structurally and um functionally i guess for for families um mm -hmm. and as a result they made some significant progress i worked with fairfield on their affordable housing plan which they adopted in 2014 they've established the fee through a uh, twist of fate or whatever you might call it turned out that sacred heart and fairfield university undertook major projects and mm -hmm. as a result, they pumped in dollars and they're now trying to figure out how to use those funds best I think everybody is seeking transparency here so that we make good choices about this and you know the CDBG funds and things like that so that we make good choices. And I think this is something again that the housing partnership can perhaps advise the council and others on in the future as, as ways that as needs become apparent that, that we could perhaps develop programs to address those. So I think it's a tool that we didn't have before and that's what makes it kind of interesting and exciting. Okay, um, and I guess maybe as a follow up to that question, um, what what kind like it, let's let's use Fairfield as an example because I think maybe New Canaan might um, yep, skew it understood. a little bit. But um, uh, what kind of money are we talking about? Like what kind of like what what does that pool of fees look like? And wh what is or who is the mechanism that uh, makes uh, decisions about how that those funds are used. So Stratford again, they have uh, don't have a housing partnership. It's the Stratford. I think it used to be called a committee. The Stratford, excuse me, uh, Fairfield Affordable Housing Committee, um, mm -hmm. now called the Affordable Housing Commission. Um, okay. And they've been active since the late '80s. They had the first lock woman over there. Really kind of got them started. But the fee has only been around for about the last six years. I think it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars at this point in Fairfield. And again, 
nobody anticipated that Sacred Heart and Fairfield University would be right. as active. So it's a little, it's an aberration, I think, mm -hmm. um, okay. but also an opportunity because now they can look at ways to leverage that money effectively. And that's a circumstance they didn't have before that opportunity. So um, okay. I can't tell you specifics in terms of things that are underway. Um, mm -hmm. But since I did work on that plan, they have contacted me over the years and asked, you know, what, did I have thoughts on how it could be done? Um, and so I know they're working in this regard. Okay. And then uh, my second question really, really quick was, um, were the nonprofits that were engaged to partake in the survey um, only Stratford-based or were they regional um, nonprofits who might be located someplace else but do work in or work with clients um, in Stratford? I think I'm going to kick that over to Susmitha because we reached out to the organizations. The people who did respond represented both local Stratford organizations, but also um, organizations that have activities within the region. Um, okay. So uh, it did include that mix, but I'm not sure how the invitation was sent. Okay. Yes, um, I, I reached out to everybody um, that our partners know and shared the survey uh, list with um, those organizations. I don't know if there are, you know, there are any regional nonprofits in there, uh, but I do know that the employees who responded, some of them are not from Stratford, but they're based in Milford, but they're actually working for Stratford, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is a good, uh, mark, uh, you know, demographic to look at uh, how mm -hmm. likely they be willing to move to Stratford and make it you know, their home. That's what okay. we would keep on looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Christina. Anybody else from planning? Moving on to zoning. Anyone from uh, Rich or Linda? I saw you guys on. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm good at the moment, Chris. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, because you're a smaller group, we'll go for a few, um, and then we can give the council the balance of the time. Uh, architectural review. And any questions that you folks or comments you guys want to bring up? Jamie Millward, um, I have one mm -hmm. question. It, mm -hmm. it kind of ties into what the previous um, person was just talking about. It, it, I also know of some towns that in, instead of doing a fee in lieu, they actually offer the opportunity to develop um remote affordable units so if someone is developing a, a parcel and you know there's x number of units and there's a certain percentage they, they need to be um affordable that they're allowed to if they want to keep you know, non-affordable units in in that on that development that they're allowed to go out and it would be purchasing another piece of property but allow them to remove to put the affordables elsewhere kind of lumped together as one large project is wondering if Mr. Schalder has any background in that, in his success, and you know, whether you think that might be something to consider as well. I think that's a great question. Thank you. I, I think the, the challenge on this is uh, comes up in a couple of different ways. So one way is that we have all of these naturally occurring affordable housing units in different parts of our community. Um, sometimes they may be naturally affordable because they could use a spruce up and that sort of hasn't happened. So allowing uh, somebody who wants to build a development but isn't perhaps as interested in the uh, long-term administration that can come with that. You have to qualify buyers and tenants and all of the other stuff. Um, they can buy and, and uh, deed restrict an existing housing unit. So buy it. Put a deed restriction on it. You can sell it for roughly the same price. The actual cost is not that great. And now we've got a deed restricted unit over time. So some people think that that's a wonderful option. There's other people who um, believe that we should be trying to incorporate diversing, the diversity of housing and diversity of people in all neighborhoods. And they believe that uh, this is perhaps a way to distinguish between uh, market rate housing and affordable housing um, and so they would prefer a process whereby new housing units get built they get deed restricted as affordable and they're similar in quality and design to the market rate so they're essentially indistinguishable so communities are working within that range 
and decide what works best for them. So I don't think there's any uh, necessarily right or wrong answer, but the end result is the production and preservation of portable units. Um, and I think that the ways that we could find to have that happen may involve the use of different tools in different circumstances. So there's there's no there's no yes or no answer on that, Mr. Miller, but there's there's a way I think to, to look at this as time goes on. Okay, thanks. I, I do have one more question. Um, okay. Wondering if uh, during the course of the survey work uh, that you reached out directly to some of the people who are the actual developers um, of properties like this, because I mean, I, I think, look, from what I know, and, and I, I've, I've been involved in some development myself, I mean, you know, the problem is often for a developer can become a financial one because you know the 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 like units are are you know kind of costing the same but you you don't you're not selling you're not selling it as a market rate unit and so i'm wondering if they were in you know the developers themselves because it you know the part of this has to make some sense financially for the people who are actually going to do this but you can put all the uh paperwork together that you want but it you know it needs to make some sense for the person who's actually going to you know to take the risk to build housing um, that's their livelihood. They deserve to, you know, make some money at it. Um, and so I'm wondering if they were engaged at all to, uh, to help maybe a, a way to structure this uh, that might be, would encourage further affordable housing development. So the, the members of the partnership of Desmond, for example, has real estate development experience. Because of COVID, we didn't, as Chris indicated, get out into the community quite as much as we might have wanted to. Uh, in terms of engaging different groups, everything ended up being sort of happening on Zoom and, and other online platforms. Um, I think the recommendation in here is tied also to the review of our regulations, the multifamily regulations. So some communities provide a density bonus for affordable housing. The issue would be, you know, for each unit of affordable housing, you can do another market rate unit. Or again, this off-site option means that. Um, you don't have to pay a fee. You don't have to be a, build a unit and then perhaps sell it at a loss. You can buy an existing unit, deed restricted, and sell it for what you purchased it for. So you have some closing costs in the transaction, but it's not as as, as out of pocket as it might otherwise have been. Um, so I, I think there's the hope here is that the plan will kind of get the discussion and movement going, um, and then we can refine this uh, as we go. Yeah, the gentleman makes a, a, a good point. We may actually want to think about maybe even talking to one or two that we have a good relationship with um, in the future. So we'll take that under advisement. Thank you, Jamie, for bringing that to our attention. Anybody else from uh, Architectural Review? And Jay Habansky has corrected me that uh, we do have a couple of people from BZA on. Any questions or comments from ZBA commissioners? Okay, good. So it looks like uh, council members, looks like you're going to get the, the balance of the time. We actually uh, are going to try to stop it right around seven o'clock. So um, we'll, we'll go through this uh, one by one. I guess I'll, hey, I'll Chris, uh, miss. Yes. Real quick, I didn't realize I had my wrong microphone on. I just had a quick okay. uh, question if I could. Mm -hmm. um, just looking at strategy four, I think it speaks okay. to the, the good work that we're trying to do. Uh, strategy four uh, on the architectural review board. Um, yes. I wondered if you could just expound a little bit upon the statement improve design guidelines. Again, we've put together uh, quite an exhaustive list, but again, I think Jamie would agree we've tried to keep it more broad brush. Um, so each of these developments that come through would be looked at in a different lens based on mm -hmm. the neighborhood context and things of that nature. So I'm wondering if you could point to specifically maybe what you were um leaning towards with that so as a board we could have those discussions and make any necessary revisions to our guidelines that you guys could see fitting in i think there were a couple of things that came up john i think uh, one of which was the threshold of which projects go to go to the design review or the architectural review process uh, and whether or not we could uh, bring more projects in People are concerned about density, and density can have a, a lot of different implications for a project. Density can be 
muffled and hidden. Uh, you don't really realize what the density is. There's this wonderful book out there that uh, uh, takes aerial photographs of different development patterns from the air and on the ground, and you look at it, and sometimes you just can't tell. Um, the other thing uh, that factored some of my thinking here and presenting information to the housing partnership for discussion was that the current trend these days in zoning is, is trying to move in a direction of what's called form-based coding. I used to work for development companies. I've never met a developer who doesn't want an approval for his project. So when you tell people up front what it is that you expect from them, whether that's through a form-based code or a visual guide of the type of development that would be appropriate, as opposed to a process that can actually be somewhat intimidating for people, um, it can provide some additional benefits. The residents understand the nature of the development that's likely to happen. They may not be as concerned or as opposed to it. The developers start to factor in the actual cost implications of design into their project and its feasibility rather than being surprised in the middle of the process. Um, so I think if, if we're, design is important to people and that's the reason why Stratford has a design review committee doing this type of stuff. So if we can use that as an opportunity to uh, help residents understand what we'd like to try to achieve and developers and other people understand what we'd like to achieve, I think it's, it's perhaps a better outcome. But I think it's it's not meant in any way, any criticism of the work that the ARB does, but if we could advance this, um, and so for example here, this concept of visual preference surveys or visual guidelines might help um, advance that conversation, um, that could be a positive outcome. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, so let's start uh, with the council. Councilman Pia, anything you want to bring to us? Or any questions for you? No questions at the time. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading the report online, uh, but I just want to say thank you for putting this together, Smith and Chris. Um, excellent job, in my opinion. And Glenn, thank you for uh, for your reporting on this so far. I'm looking forward to the report. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilman Sheik, good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for giving us this presentation and um, review of what is happening in uh, Stratford. You know, my, my concern um, with housing period here in this town and because of the pandemic, we've had an influx of people moving into Stratford um, 2020 and it's still happening now. But the people that are moving in um, are financially well off. So my concern always uh, goes back to you know the reality of the majority of people who are living here and from the data that uh, you shared with us the median income for residents who live here in Stratford is lower than our surrounding communities so my concern um, in any development is how moving forward um, you know we're using the data to address um, equity issues. So um, I'm looking forward to further uh, hearing from this group of specifically how, uh, you know, we are going to address those needs. Um, I agree with some of the comments or concerns that were raised before. Yes, it's frustrating. I think it was Mr. Boyd, you know, the, the census data is from 10 years ago, um, but we know from, um, our school population of our children here um, and parents that we do have an influx, um, a significant influx of families moving in. And here in District 2, um, it, we have quite a diverse, right spectrum of income. You have, you know, more affluent areas in Paradise Green and then you're running along Barnum and there's an obvious difference. Um, and the goal is to increase the quality of life for all of our residents here and with the data that we have the growing population from what you presented was a 65 plus so we have um a couple of different areas here in district two um that are poised um <clears throat> to have additional um, areas where we can create these spaces um, to 
not only uh, you know attract uh, young professionals so that we have a base of uh, families and young professionals wanting to come here and live here, um, but to be realistic in the fact that the median income here in this town for the majority of our residents is lower than our neighbors. So um, I'm looking forward to <laughs> learning more um, and hearing more from, from this group of how we can address those needs specifically. Uh, Glenn, you want to uh, try to address some of the items? I, I think the housing market is very dynamic. When we started our work, uh, not quite a year ago, but might be getting close to that. Um, nobody was really sure what COVID was going to do and what was going to happen. And then we started to see indications of, of how things might change. Um, for people who live here today, they have housing already. For people who are looking to uh, move into Stratford or have housing in the community, prices are going up. So that does put a squeeze on the community and people who are here or here, even people who rent. Um, and, you know, the elderly uh, can have a particularly difficult situation because a um, number of people have uh, available pension plans or other things like that, but sometimes the elderly do not, and they're living longer than they expected to. So the challenges that they have, and so they can be equity rich, but cash poor. So there's so many circumstances to try to grapple with, and they can vary by neighborhoods and, and districts and so on. So it becomes quite a challenge is to, is to figure out what we can do. Um, the run up, if you will, in prices because of COVID, um, could put housing out of reach for people. Um, interest rates are at historic lows right now. But housing purchases have never been more affordable than they are right now. And housing prices are responding as a result of that. And the scary thing for somebody, if they were to buy housing today at low interest rates and the interest rates go up, when they go to sell that affordable unit, it's restricted based on the income of people and the interest rate. They could lose money on a purchase because the next person won't be able to finance as much. And so we, we need to be sensitive to that as well and make sure that we, we get the dynamics of what's going on. And that's why this is such a challenge for communities. And there's no one, one size fits all solution. I think we've tried to put together for the next five years, a set of strategies that will start Stratford moving in this direction and then continue to refine it as we go based on what successful in Stratford, what other communities are doing, what assistance we can get from the state, um, et cetera, to try and address these issues. Thank you, Glenn. And, and to your point, you know, we, yes, we want to build, we want to build, we want to, you know, revive um, different areas that we already have here in, in town, but we also need to be cognizant of those people who are also currently homeowners um and how you know we want to make this um a town really we're almost a city right we're fifty thousand people um that people want to live and they want to stay and they can afford it so thanks yeah and i think those are some excellent points about what we faced in the last year with uh, some new population from New York, a number, number of people came here, uh, and uh, it's just been quite a bit of changes. And um, you know, we've even looked at um, and discussed a little bit about how St Stratford, just the geography of it, uh, creates some interesting challenges of it being long and narrow, uh, being considered a suburb but an inner ring suburb. So there are some, you know, some uh, demographic and geographic challenges that you know we have to account for, and that's um, been highlighted in some other reports as well. Uh, moving along, Councilman Tavares, I believe I saw you on. Yes, thank you. I I also uh, want to offer my kudos for this uh, gathering of all the diverse and different uh, committees. Uh, more or less, I'll give you a three and one. Um, more or less okay. concern. Uh, <laughs> Um, are, are there any parameters to make sure that not any one district gets targeted for uh, affordable housing? Uh, my second question, are there any uh, guidelines so that developers uh, do not manipulate um, any kind of gray areas to uh, circumvent the true nature 
of the affordable housing. And uh, my third question is, are there any other watchdogs to prevent any gentrification of any of the districts? Those are all great questions. Are there any watchdogs? I would say that all of the boards and commissions, the, the zoning commission, the planning commission, the council, uh, the, the architecture review board. I mean, I think everybody cares about Stratford and the future of Stratford. So I think the idea would be to try to find places that um, housing could be accommodated. And it doesn't always have to be new construction, but perhaps there could be redevelopment um, we're, we're starting to see a transition due to the internet economy that, you know, the storefronts and businesses that we used to thrive in our community are struggling a little bit. There may be buildings and locations that could, in fact, provide a transition between business areas, and, um, people's desire to get out and go dining again, and then stable neighborhoods, et cetera, to actually incorporate housing, strengthen the businesses, et cetera. So, um, these are all sorts of things we're kind of struggling with. And I think the, the planning uh, board is going to be working on the POCD update. It's due in 2024. Um, so these issues can start to now be incorporated and considered in terms of what's what's happening there. So I, I think that this is not meant to be a, a plan that specifies what's going to happen on a particular site. It's a set of guidelines as to how we can start to address housing needs and issues and continue this dialogue going forward. Um, and I think that's that's going to be the real sign of success is that we continue to work away at this and, and see opportunities um, that uh, may may come up. Thank you. And, and uh, go ahead, Justice Mina. I'm I'm sorry. Um, I raised my hand, but I think um, you can't see me uh, from the so many screens. No, I cannot. Um, so you, go so, ahead. You have the floor. <laughs> uh, I wanted to respond back to Commissioner Tavares and also um, our Architectural Review Board Chair, uh, Jamie Millward's concern about um, financing from the developer side. Um, and, you know, uh, Commissioner Tavares' comment about uh, how we can, um, the community can have some guidelines uh, to override predatory uh, developers. These are all, um, I feel, interlinked and they all lead to one solution, which is to get to a moratorium so that the community could actually um, gain some control on uh, where and how they can locate uh, affordable housing and what types of developments they want to see in the community. And um, if we if the community were to seek a developers or um, real estate investors input right now my guess is that most would not like any fees to be imposed on them uh, but it is also a sound uh, planning guide and you know this is a policy guide and um, for it is for the community to evaluate its own situation and see where it is with the development market right now as far as uh, I'm looking at it from a planner's perspective, I think um, there's a lot of development coming up and happening, and um, this is a good time uh, to think about these strategies. Otherwise, um, you know, two years down the lane, you might have missed a golden opportunity because um, the unit count is increasing, but your affordable units count is not increasing proportionately. So uh, right now, Stratford is at 6.37%, but two years down the lane, you may be at 5%, and your ratio will keep going down. And uh, this is the time to uh, critically you know, analyze the current situation and look at what solutions you have so that it also partially addresses um, uh, Commissioner, I mean, Councilman Tavares' concern about um, you know, how the community can gain control on these um, out of character affordable housing developments. And that's uh, a great point to bring because one thing that we, I know it came out in, especially in our early discussions is, you know, with all that we've been through in the last year, going to officially as of today, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out where things are going. You know, a year ago, you might have said, oh, yes, we were, you know, um, uh, you know, TOD was a very big topic. People wanted to have access to be able to go and work in Manhattan and so on. 
um, well, that, we're not sure where that's going right now as, as, as a societal trend um, and what people's housing needs are. I, I would imagine right now, if we're talking to folks about what they're, and we didn't ask it as a question, but uh, how important is having a home office in your house? Well, I guess that's very important these days. So, you know, <laughs> yes. some of the, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, a number of these things, when we're talking about strategies, they were a little vague because, because we are in an evolving situation, probably in, in something that we have not seen in the last 20, 30 years. So we're trying to be um, as open-minded and, uh, you know, approach the situation as open-mindedly as possible. Okay, uh, Councilman Tavares, anything else from you? I'm I'm also in the, in the process of uh, getting the the report and and generate some things. So, but um, yeah, believe me, I will. And by all means, that. you know, feel free if you have any comments and to any of the members on anybody on on the call today, feel free to uh, send uh, you know any communication over to the planning and zoning office, and they'll be happy to make sure it gets to us, and we can respond accordingly. Absolutely, thank you. Okay. Uh, I didn't see Councilman Hardin on, so Councilman Can, I know you attend our meetings every now and then. How are you, sir? Any questions? Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, I, I first want to thank Glenn that uh, just as a uh, listening into a few of the meetings, uh, that his guidance and his expertise, uh, his advice, and his just nurturing all the ideas, it, it was wonderful to hear him in action uh, my uh, my question is around the next steps so the report does summarize uh, many opportunities and alternative solutions uh, what where do we go from here and what should our timeline be that is a great question thank you greg i think um as part of the strategies uh, in the report, we've identified the agency or entity that we think is likely to be the leader. So if you look at each subheading, so for example, my page is open right now to um, strategy 8, 8.1, talks about seeking relief from 830G, and it has the responsible entity as being town. Now, town is, is unfortunately here a generic term. But there's so many boards and entities in town that are going to be involved in that. So we've tried, tried to make this plan useful by identifying responsibilities as what different boards and commissions can or should be doing to help move, move us forward. We did not put specific time frames on this. I mean, I think our, our efforts were to try to coalesce thoughts in, uh, into a plan about housing strategies for the future. Um, but if we get too specific or too directive and say to a board or commission, you have to do this in six months. One of the challenges we have in a municipality is that no board or commission really kind of gets to tell the other boards or commissions what to do. They each have independent statutory authority or authority under town ordinances. And how do we pull all of this together? So I think the housing partnership recently constituted, uh, reconstituted under the mayor's initiative I think provides an opportunity to work with other boards and coach them and try to uh, encourage them to address these sorts of issues um, and do it in a um, purposeful way, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, so uh, could they put together specific action steps, specific timelines? Yes, they could. But as we've seen in the past year, circumstances sometimes change. Um, so I think it's been my experience as a planner over the years that having uh, defined goals and strategy, having an organization such as the Housing Partnership can continue to monitor this plan and efforts, and then have a collaborative approach to the timing to respond to opportunities um, is, is a, a good way for us to proceed. Um, thank you, Glenn. Uh, one more follow-up. Aside from the imperative of meeting the housing needs of our evolving community, and is there an outside uh, is there an outside deadline? Meaning, if uh, the state of Connecticut has something about a 10% minimum, there's a lot of solutions to get that. You can have moratoriums, et cetera. Uh, is there any outside factor? that would motivate us to make some decisions sooner than others? 
There could be. I think as Chris mentioned earlier, there's quite a bit going on up at Hartford this year, and they're talking about this as being important for the state and the economy. So uh, that might cause Stratford to look at perhaps accelerating or doing some things before others. Um, so I, I think that it's it's a, a goal that can be incrementally advanced. Um, I don't think there's too, too many touchdown passes that are gonna happen with this because housing takes a long time to produce. Um, so I think as long as we uh, continue to make progress, um, I mean, I know that the, for example, the housing authority is working on um, looking at their uh, holdings um, and uh, thinking that there could be opportunities to increase the number of units to get in line for state and federal funding. Um, so that could be something that we could kind of perhaps all get behind now and push on and try to get to the front of the line by adopting our housing plan before other municipalities have, we can maybe jump to the front of the line. So that could be something that could be opportunistic for us. Um, okay. There's certainly a significant demand for those uh, funding programs around the state, around the country, um, but those are the types of opportunities that may present themselves. Uh, I'll, I like, hmm. So I'm gonna raise two potential opportunities related to 10.4, which is enable smaller scale multifamily housing. Um, one property was mentioned on Broadbridge Avenue that used to be a gas station. And then I think about Wood Avenue oh. where the town is considering, a, well, uh, there's a property the town owns that we're gonna be selling. Um, so these may be two examples of candidates if the zoning enabled this smaller scale multifamily housing. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the time frame for our land use boards to evaluate and maybe make that decision to enable it? Is that a six month process or? Don't know. One of the challenges uh, not with municipal entities is that boards and commissions may meet once a month or twice a month. So the sequence of timing of the dialogue that needs to happen can be challenging. We can kind of accelerate that a little bit through working groups to try to, to come to resolution. Um, but I do think that if, if we could find a way to, on a town property at a strategic location, use good design uh to produce a result that people say that's an attractive building that addresses housing needs my i, I have a friend whose mother lives there something like that these are things that could be very very influential moving forward when people hear about housing and density they start to get concerned that it's it's like co-op city or it's something else which is it's not that's not that's not stratford that's not our goal or intention so if a developer i mean um if a developer had a package that said, this has been reviewed by the land use boards and they have endorsed this concept. I didn't get an approval, but I feel comfortable now investing money that there's not gonna be too many surprises down the road. This is a concept that works. So I think those types of things could really help the town accomplish these objectives through a cooperative effort. That, that, and the timing, I just don't know, Greg, how long that would take. Uh, Glenn, to, to, you, you said the two magic words right there, I think, to, to answer the councilman's question is cooperative don't, effort. My two magic words are don't know, Chris. <laughs> no, co cooperative effort, because, there you, go. Um, you know, if there are opportunities that are out there, um, and obviously just the fact that we're having this meeting, we've invested the time and resources in, in getting to this, uh, you obviously have a number of officials here that are committed to moving forward on this. Whenever you have a plan, um, the more you can, the, the various entities that would have jurisdiction over it can communicate with each other and understand what's going on and work through any of the details, the better off it's going to be. Um, from a zoning perspective, if it's something that is not buildable by right, um, usually there is an amendment, a text amendment or a zoning regulation change that has to go through. So it doesn't really work very well with hypotheticals um, you know so in the formulation the ideation phase of a development um, it's probably good to make sure that 
such as uh, the planning, zoning, uh, the d different boards, uh, you know, have some degree of involvement and cooperation, and then that makes it move quicker. Does it take six months to a year? Probably not. I think we've actually gotten very good in the last decade or so in moving things uh, along through the process and, uh, you know, expediting them to make sure that they don't get bogged down um, at certain points. Uh, so, you know, if there's an opportunities either that you just mentioned, Wood Avenue, Broadbridge Avenue, by all means, um, you know, even one thing that the housing partnership can do is, you know, facilitate the discussion between the different groups there to make sure that something can actually work at a, um, um, how can I say this, an appropriate p pace. Because you don't want to rush anything. But on the other hand, you don't want it to, you know, be a 30-year development project. And I think the other thing too, Chris, is I think you've got excellent staff in Jay and mm -hmm. Smitha and other people at Town Hall, and you mm -hmm. could actually assemble an ad hoc informal working group to kind of work out some of these parameters. Some communities around the state these days are using a tool called planned development districts. And normally in zoning and planning, we sometimes do a sequential process. We come up with the idea, then we vet it out, then we apply for the reg change, or we modify the POCD and set the stage for the reg change, and all this stuff happens sequentially like a chain. The planned development district is a, is a crazy tool because it's basically a situation where you can approve the development and authorize it under one application at one time. So as somebody referred to it once with me from the movie Aladdin, for those of you who have kids or have heard of this, it's the regulation with amazing cosmic power, <laughs> and it works on an itty-bitty little space. Itty-bitty living space. Thank you, Robin. Well, the issue ends up being that <laughs> if you wanted to be flexible, but to try to encourage things, there are tools. And I think, again, it, I like the concept, Chris, of cooperative, because hearing you talk about how we might do that brought to mind... <laughs> that kind of tool that the town could start to think about um, and, and might help accomplish the things that work best for Stratford. Thank Chris, you guys. If I, I may add to this. Go ahead, Sismina. Yeah, um, I think in terms of uh, zoning regulation changes, the plan identifies a lot of regulation changes, but uh, if the this group wants to take it to the next level, you know, maybe between now and when the final draft comes out, if you are able to prioritize what are the regulation changes that you would like to see uh, immediately or like the low hanging fruit, uh, maybe that could be something that, you know, we can, like uh, Glenn suggested, form a working group to look into um, and after the plan is adopted. The second thing I would like to say is um, I like the idea of plant department districts, but I want you to be very cautious with that because in New Haven, we had almost 30 to 40 plant department districts. It essentially, I mean, New Haven was also, is also a special act community. So it, at the end of the day, it essentially feels like there is no predictable zoning anywhere. And each plant department district having its own uh, standards was also causing a confusion among the audiences as, uh, as to you know, um, what the predictable open space ratio would be and um, other uh, standards associated with it. But if we, I mean, in terms of doing any regulation changes like that, an outside consultant would be definitely useful because we don't want to enter legal challenges. Um, and that's why there are some that we can work on in-house such as Maybe, I mean, I was talking to Jay this morning, uh, yesterday, I think, about two-family housing, how we can, uh, you know, bring them back as of right, or, you know, smaller changes, but the bigger changes may need outside help. Let me just say for the record, Chris, too, that um, every town I've ever had a chance to work with, I, I enjoy uh, seeing them evolve and grow, so that in the future, if questions like this come up, you or Jay or Sid Smith or others can certainly reach out to me uh, and ask me questions about uh, these types of tools. Um, mm -hmm. Some communities have used the PDD process to pre-approve the development concept for the site, conceptual drawings. It doesn't mm -hmm. yet get to the level of a site plan approval but it's pre-approved and the developer jumps at that opportunity because the issue is they don't get the uncertainty in the months of time. 
it can accelerate that process. So just, again, I'd be happy to share whatever experiences I have from around the state to help Stratford. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Harold, just be quick, because I want to try to get to as many people as I can. We're starting to get tight on time. Okay, I just want to say that it's something that we discussed within the committee often mm -hmm. about the whole fee, the fee building a, a fund for, for the housing partnership to do exactly that kind of a thing, to put together uh, design ideas for specific projects that we could then look for developers for. That That's nice. one of the ways of thinking differently um, in the future that I that I fully support. I, I think to give us a new insight. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Okay. Um, uh, Councilman Khan, anything else? Um, okay. No, Chris. Perfect. Thank okay. you so much. Okay, thank you. And certainly reach out if anything else comes to mind. Uh, Councilman Poison. I know I saw him here. And, uh, or Councilman Perillo? Oh, no, I have no comments, but thank you for the presentation. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, Councilman. Um, let's see, Mr. I don't see Jim Connor on. So, uh, Phil O'Brien? Sure, Chris. Thank, thanks yes. to uh, Glenn and the Housing Partnership for all your work on this. I, I can tell there is a a lot of work put into it, but um, I want to mention too, Chris, back to what you said about population. I know for years, Stratford was under 50,000, and according to the 2010 census, it's now 51,384, and that has helped us greatly with more uh, grants, but Stratford is probably more developed than almost any other town in Connecticut. I, I hear figures of 95 to 98 percent. Could you guys talk a little bit about open space and the need for open space? And then another problem we have is many units, oh, I guess I would describe them as west of Broadbridge Avenue that would qualify under affordable housing, but apparently the boards there do not want to be considered affordable housing. Is there a way we could come up with incentives to bring them in into the program, which would get us a lot closer to 10 percent? And uh, I think, well, like another other thing, I think Glenn mentioned um, density. When I did some research, I found that Stratford has a population density of 29,919 people per square mile. Milford is at 2395 a square mile. And Milford has a moratorium on affordable housing. So those are my questions. Thanks. Those are some biggies. <laughs> no, no, I think I think there's a lot of different ways that uh, affordable housing could be created or established. Um, so, uh, in terms of certain neighborhoods and other stuff like that, those are areas where I think the housing partnership and others could look uh, and see what the opportunities may be. Um, I don't think in the future communities in Connecticut will be able to do moratoriums on affordable housing. Um, I think you either get a uh, moratorium uh, by earning points where you get an exemption because you're over the 10 percent um, but that's actually revolves around the production of units and so i think if we can find ways to advance that conversation as Sis smith indicated earlier that could get us a moratorium and allow us to continue to move ahead in the survey results there was strong support across the board that people would like stratford zoning to control what happens in stratford they don't really <laughs> like the idea that somebody can come in and tell us what the development's going to be so that was something that motivated people to uh, think flexibly about affordable housing Um, Bill, did you, and I know that you had probably a couple other things. I know you did talk about the um, the West of Broadbridge situation. I think um, in the plan, I would just highlight that we actually did talk a bit about um, what we'll call, what was the term that we use, naturally occurring affordable housing, and you know, verifying the status of it so that it counts towards our, our count. Um, obviously, that 10% number um, is a high area of concern uh, just because of what it triggers through 8-30G. 
Um, so one of the strategies that is, I know it's in here, I'm not sure which number it is, is there is that we, um, you know, make sure that as much of our for natural occurring affordable housing or, uh, you know, it can be counted towards our goal. And um, um, I believe we have some text in here that actually goes through that. And uh, but I will make sure that that is highlighted uh, as we go forward on this so that it is taken care of or acknowledged. OK, thank you, Chris. OK, uh, Councilwoman Dancho, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, last, I think I'm the last one. I guess um, so. <laughs> we saved the best for last. There you go. Absolutely. You go. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate a lot of what was previously said and particularly what Bill O'Brien just brought up. Um, a lot of people, because if one thing COVID has taught us is that a lot of people are moving out of dense housing situations and moving up into um, our town, which is probably uh, the closest to New York City that is the most affordable for a lot of people. Um, so they're moving up for our quality of life. So what I would like, our, especially our zoning and our planning commissions are really going to have a lot of work with making sure that our needs for affordable housing and for senior housing in particular maybe um, address areas that can be repurposed rather than moving into our virgin forest and our virgin lands that um, should be protected more so and it seems like a lot of these big condo developments just like to come into our woods um, so I would like to see that addressed and also I would like to know if there's some sort of an inventory on the housing um, that's available in our town right now and maybe the percentages of affordable and uh, senior housing if there's some sort of an inventory that we could see where the particular need is right now. Uh, just if I can jump on that quickly, I think that the, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, a lot of the information we, all of the information we collected is in booklets, which is on file at the, on the uh, town hall and on the uh, website or web page at, um, for the housing partnership. So we do have an inventory of the units in town that count to the uh, affordable housing appeals list, which are affordable in the housing authority and other projects like that. We actually don't State does not release information on who is a receives tenant rental assistance in their address or uh, receive a, a CHFA mortgage, a low a lower uh, income mortgage product, um, because that's considered to be personal and private. Um, but there is other information that is available to help us. Harold found a document put together, um, I think by CHFA, which was full of interesting information in terms of housing and, and things like that. So there are resources out there to help communities and available to Stratford. Is there a way that a single family home could be considered affordable? Is there such thing as building single family or, um, you know, houses that are closer together that are still single family and have that be considered affordable? The affordable threshold is based solely on the sale price or rental rate. <clears throat> so really any housing could, any housing style could be affordable. Um, so that certainly is an opportunity. I think as was indicated earlier, that the economics of that can be a challenge at times um, because of land costs, because of uh, construction costs. Sometimes you lose the efficiency of scale the, between two units that are detached, each have to build a wall between them. But if they're actually attached, there's one last wall. There's some thermal efficiencies and other things like that that happen. So these are all trade-offs to, to be considered as part of what works best for Stratford in different areas. Thank you for putting the report together. Um, I just I just would like people to understand that not everyone who qualifies for affordable housing wants to live in a um, duplex or um, I, I think that we need to really think about the quality of life in our in our town and, and preserve that. Definitely, definitely. Okay, we've gone through the group. We're just about at time. So I want to, first of all, thank everybody who attended uh, from the various boards. I did see a few people come in who did not, who were here after roll call. I believe that we probably mentioned Ken Poisson, Laura Dancho, uh, Len Petroselli, 
I'm looking through this really quick to see if there's any other names that I've missed. If there's anybody else that didn't quite make roll call or I didn't uh, mention, um, please just speak up. Um, if not, again, as I mentioned at the beginning here, we are still uh, working on this draft. It sh is going to be going through an approval process, so it will probably come before um, your boards at some point before the beginning of the summer. Uh, if you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to send them over to Jay Habansky and Sesmita, uh, since they are the staff members who are helping with this, and they'll be bringing it to the attention of the partnership. Um, and again, thank you everybody for all that you do for our town. All of us, uh, you know, give up our nights and uh, and uh, the success and the future of our town uh, depends on the hard work of so many people. So thank you very much, and I'm going to wish everyone a good evening. And with that. Um, I think I will say that the uh, the um, this meeting of the partnership will stand adjourned at 7:05 p.m. Um, everybody have a good evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Susmita. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.